In this lecture, I'll introduce you to Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. Paul seems to have written this letter in the year 57. The last letter we've heard from him, probably 2 Corinthians in 55, what's happened in those two years? Paul tells us something in chapter 15 that allows us to fill in the blanks a little bit. So this is chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Paul talks about having preached the gospel from Jerusalem through to Illyricum. Now, we know a lot of his ministry from other letters, and we can reconstruct when he was in Jerusalem and Galatia and Ephesus, etc. But Illyricum is a puzzle. It looks as if Illyricum falls into the time period be, uh, between the writing of 2 Corinthians and the writing of Romans, so between 55 and 57. Illyricum is that piece of land that lies on the other side of Italy, over the sea, across the water, which we today might call Croatia, Bosnia. We have no idea of what Paul did there, only that he was there. It's to the northwest of Corinth, the northwest of Thessalonica and Philippi, and he seems to have taken the gospel there. He's now returned to Corinth, and it's from Corinth that he writes his longest letter that we have, the letter to the Christians in Rome. And these are Christians whose communities he had nothing to do with in terms of their establishment. This is odd because every other letter written to communities by Paul are letters written to communities that he has founded himself. Romans, he has had nothing to do with in terms of the founding of Roman communities, and yet it's also his longest letter. So the question is, why did Paul write this long letter to communities that he had nothing to do with in terms of their founding, their establishment? There's all sorts of ways of answering this question. Let me highlight a few of the most important. The first thing we need to do is to remember Paul's controversial reputation. We've already seen some of this from some of the letters we've studied already. We can also glimpse his controversial reputation in terms of what follows next in his lifeline. <laughs> Acts tells us that when Paul leaves to take the collection from his communities and take it back to Jerusalem to support the Christians in need there, things went wrong. And things went wrong precisely because he had a controversial reputation. Uh, his view of the law, uh, the, way things, the way his gospel was being heard in relation to God's faithfulness to the people of Israel, things of this sort caused Paul, upon his arrival in Jerusalem, to be received without welcome arms. Paul suspects as much even when writing to Christians in Rome. He tells them, for instance, uh, in chapter 15, verse 30 through 32, that something may be on the horizon which is unpleasant, and he asks for their prayers. Let's read that. Verses 30 to 32, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. Another factor that we need to include when understanding why Paul wrote Romans is what he tells us again in chapter 15, in this case, verse 24. I plan to visit you when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through. 
and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Paul wants to go beyond Rome to the Western uh, regions, which in his day were called Spain, and take his gospel there. But the little phrase uh, that he uses in this verse uh, is indicative of his interest in having them give him financial support. He says, to have you assist me on my journey there. He probably means more than just wave him off at the harbor. He probably means, I need some assistance financially from you if my gospel is to be taken even further afield within God's creation. So he's looking for their support. In this regard, it's interesting that he sends the letter with Phoebe, a woman who we hear of from chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. She's someone who Paul calls a benefactor of many people, including me. And the word benefactor is again an economic or financial term. She seems to have sponsored financially Christian groups and communities in the Corinthian area. And now she is taking Paul's letter and delivering it to Christians in Rome. She herself being a model of someone who supports Paul's ministry financially. Precisely what Paul seems to be wanting from Christians in Rome if he can take his gospel to those in Spain who have not yet heard the good news. This introduces, however, another dimension of why Paul will be writing this letter to Christians in Rome. He needs, in essence, to preach his gospel to them. They need to hear what he's about if they are to support him. <laughs> And he says something of this sort in, First, uh, in Romans 1.14, where he talks about being eager to preach his gospel to them. But he's also careful that he's not backing them into a corner. He's giving them some freedom to join freely. And so in chapter 15, he says that he also doesn't want to preach where faith uh, is already based. Uh, so Paul wants to... Uh, gently bring his, his readership in Rome on board, and he uh, stands by his gospel. He says as much in chapter 1, verse 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Why would Paul choose to express himself in this way? It seems as if some think Paul really should be ashamed of the gospel that he preaches. It is a gospel, after all, in which God's law seems to be set aside in some peculiar ways. We've seen things like this already in Galatians. And we've also seen how in Corinth, people are saying, well, if we don't have to abide by any laws or rules, and if God is a God of grace, then it looks pretty cool. We can sin, and the more we sin, the more God will be shown to be gracious. And Paul has to show that this is a misunderstanding of his gospel. There are people who have misunderstood what Paul is about, and he has to defend and explain his gospel thoroughly in order to allow the Roman Christians to come on board and to sponsor him financially. Paul says this in something like Romans 6, 15. He entertains the objection, um, almost the Corinthian objection. And remember, he's writing from Corinth. The Corinthians seem to have come on board again um, and are a part of his ministry. Paul says later on that they are going to support his collection for the poor in, in Jerusalem. So these are people who got Paul wrong on this. But now he's writing to the Romans on precisely these matters. So when he says in, in Romans 6, 15, Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Some might have thought Paul would say yes, but Paul says no way. <laughs> By no means. 
And if the law has been a problem for Paul in Paul's ministry, people have misunderstood how Paul understands the law, so too the people of the law, ethnic Israel. And so it's not surprising that Paul has to spend three chapters dealing with God's relationship with Israel. Uh, Romans 9 through 11. Difficult, tough chapters, but chapters that are required because Paul is explaining how his gospel is not a gospel that he should be ashamed of. In fact, he proves in those chapters that God is faithful to Israel in a surprising and mysterious way as seen in the light of the gospel. We see these two issues of law, behavior, ethics, and uh, the people of Israel, ethnic Israel, come together in chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, where again those two things combine. Shall we sin in order that grace may abound? Uh, may it not be, verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3. And just a little bit earlier, what, what if some have been unfaithful, seeming to refer to the people of Israel? Does that mean God isn't faithful? And Paul says, by no means. These two issues have dogged Paul's reputation all along. And as he's asking for the support of the Romans, he needs to set the record straight. And this is what he does in Romans. One other thing he does, one other reason why he needs to write this letter, he needs to show that his gospel enhances Christian communities. And in fact, it even enhances their Christian communities. They too can benefit from Paul's gospel. So in chapters 14 and 15, Paul tackles an issue that seems to be a problem in Rome. How do Christians with different convictions about eating food, what foods are clean and what foods aren't. How do Christians who have different convictions come together in meal situations to express their unity? And Paul offers a solution in the light of Christ for that. It's a practical solution to a problem that they themselves are experiencing. In fact, the whole of chapters 12 through 15 are ways of talking about how his gospel, the gospel of uh, the righteousness of God helps to foster Christian communities in profitable, fruitful, and healthy ways. So the whole of 12 to 15 is a way of saying, here's how my gospel benefits Christian communities like yours and Christian communities that I'm hoping to plant even in Spain. What is it in Romans that Paul wants to convey theologically? In Romans Paul presents theological discourse that once again covers a huge canvas. <laughs> the problem is huge and the solution is even bigger. Let's look at this in terms of the problem and then in terms of the solution. Paul talks about the problem in several places. If we look at Romans 5, for instance, we hear a lot about sin and death verses 12 to 21 in particular, we'll see there that Paul talks about sin and death in a way that is hard to disentangle whether Paul is using the terms to talk about us in our individual lives, we are sinners, we die, or whether he's talking about sin and death as cosmic powers, things that transcend who we are, but define who we are. We've seen something like this already in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul, Paul talked about death being the final enemy that needs to be destroyed. And here he does something similar. We see it, for instance, in chapter 5, verse 14. This is the power of death that has intentionality within God's world and impresses itself on each and every person as we die. Little d in our deaths, uh, big D, the power of the cosmic power of death. He does the same thing uh, in the same context with, with relation to sin. Uh, in verse 17 and in verse 21, he uses the same verb uh, to talk about uh, sin, the power of sin being an overlord, reigning, being the king. And this, of course, is a threat 
to the sovereignty of God. Something is maneuvering itself within God's good creation and bringing about results that run contrary to God's intention. So Paul says in chapter 6, verse 12, do not let sin reign. Do not let sin be king in your life. And it's talking here about this cosmic power of sin that forces individuals to conform to its ways. It's a drastic uh, description of the problem. It's sobering, it's scary, it's huge. Paul does something similar in chapter 7, where he talks about God giving the law, the good law, which is, which is holy and righteous. And yet the power of sin takes control of even that and uses it for its purposes. Is God truly sovereign or is sin sovereign? Is God's reign up? Is God up to the job of being sovereign in this world? These are the kinds of big issues that Paul is dealing with when he forefronts these issues of the cosmic powers of sin and death. What does sin look like? <laughs> In practice, he tells us in chapter 7, it looks like covetousness. It looks like my will to, uh, to care for myself over and above others, to use others as resources for my own self-advancement, brute self-interestedness. This is what the power of sin induces within its world. And so Paul talks in Romans 3, 9 about all the world being under sin, under the, under the cosmic power of sin. It's in this regard that we need to balance Paul's understanding of the problem in relation to human sinfulness, which is part of the problem, and this much larger complex, the cosmic powers, one of which is sin, another which, of which is death. For Paul, dealing with our sins is like a proxy war in a much larger battle uh, against larger forces that are pervading God's good creation. What then about the solution? Paul frames the solution around the phrase, the righteousness of God. If the problem is big and manifold, in its various levels, so too is the solution. If we think about the phrase righteousness of God, we can understand it in relation to various dimensions. One is how it's used in the Old Testament. In Psalms, for instance, Psalm 98, Paul uses it in relation to God's covenant faithfulness to Israel. So we read in Psalm 98, verses 2 and 3, The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Paul here links God's righteousness with his faithfulness, his loyalty to the people of Israel, whom he has elected in covenant relationship. And Paul says something similar in Romans as he's concluding the letter. So in chapter 15 of Romans, he says this in verses 8 and 9. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews, or a servant of the circumcised, literally, on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. This is very much saying what we saw in the psalm just a moment ago. God's truth or truthfulness is at stake. And Jesus has been a servant to the circumcised, to the Jews, in order that the nations might ultimately 
benefit from what God has done in Christ. There's an intricate connection between what God is doing in relation to the whole world and the particularity of God's chosen people, Israel. This is something that Paul has said already in Romans 11, where he uses an analogy of the olive tree, where the natural branches of ethnic Israel are being joined by unnatural branches, the Gentiles, who are being inserted into, in a sense, the story of God's grace in relation to ethnic Israel. We see something similar at the very end of chapter 15 of Romans and verse 27, where he's talking about Gentile Christians being pleased to participate in the collection for the Christians in Jerusalem, the Jewish Christians. For he says, they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the spiritual blessings of the Jews, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. Whatever God is doing in relation to the whole of the world, he's doing in relation also to his covenant faithfulness to Israel. Another dimension of the righteousness of God that we need to foreground is, of course, the individual nature of God's transformation and the corporate nature of that as well. God's righteousness is grabbing individuals um, and transforming them by the power of God uh, in communities of Christian love and service. And this is where we see Romans 12 to 15 in particular operating, but elsewhere too. But we're mindful of that verse, be transformed uh, by the renewal of your minds. Uh, and we're mindful of verses such as Romans 13, 8 and 13, 10, where, talks about, where Paul talks about love being the fulfillment of the law. These Christian communities then are to be displaying a moral ethos that runs completely contrary to the ethos of covetousness, the, co the um, ethos of brute self-interestedness. And this is part and parcel of what God is doing in relation to the righteousness of God displayed in Christ and the story of what God has been doing in Christ and his communities. The final dimension of the righteousness of God that needs to be mentioned is the creational dimension of this. We've seen that the problem includes the whole of God's good creation. And so the solution has to go that far as well. We've seen this already, as I said, in relation to first, in 1 Corinthians 15, the power of death. We've seen it in relation to powers, the powers of sin and death already in this letter. So it's not surprising that at the end of Romans 8, which is the end of really the whole of ch uh, chapters 1 through 8 in this large theological discourse, Paul ends by going to the full extent of the canvas. Let me read to you then Romans 8 verses 38 and 39. And this is where he ends the first large section of discourse before he picks up on the next issue about God's faithfulness to ethnic Israel. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The canvas is huge, uh, but the canvas is also particular. The righteousness of God working at the various levels from individual to community to the whole of creation. And so it's no surprise that Paul speaks of creation itself being eager for the fulfillment of glory to be seen even in it. 
So let me read verses 19 and 21 of chapter 8. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be released. The creation itself will be liberated from its, its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. This is why Romans is a magnificent text. It brings together all sorts of things that Paul has been dealing with, and it sets forth the solution of God in Christ on the largest canvas possible. 